All right, so in this lecture, we're going to start introducing the concept of nilpotent groups. So this is definitely a brand new concept for everybody. And so rather than give the definition, I might give some intuition behind the idea. So previously, we were talking about solvable groups briefly, where the idea is that you want to construct a subnormal series. For your group such that the quotients are all abelian. So note this has to do with being solvable. But I mean, how might you try to do that? Well, it goes without saying that G1 is an abelian group. And so, if you were to try to create such a thing, you might want to do you might want to ask yourself, what would be a natural choice of an abelian group and an arbitrary group G that I know exists? And there certainly are a few options, but one choice you might try so you might try setting g1 equal to the center of g. We know the center of g is abelian, and we know the center of g is normal in g. Of course, this doesn't give us a uh, subnormal series, so currently we'd be saying e the trivial group, which I'm just going to denote by 1, is normal in the center which is normal in G. But of course, G mod C, G might not be abelian. But G mod Z, G also has a center. right, which is normal in it. And so certainly you can get this subnormal series, as, as we've discussed before, by using the isomorphism theorems, you can replace this group, which is a subgroup of this quotient, with a group subgroup of the original group containing the z of g by using the, one of the isomorphism theorems. So in other words, there should exist a new group, we'll call it g2 for right now, that contains the center. And such that because this normality condition, it must be normal in g such that g2 mod the center is actually equal to this center of this quotient group. And so now you have a 1 that's normal in g1, that's normal in g2, that's normal in g. And in particular, this quotient right here, g2 mod g1, well, since G wants the center, it's this group here, it's this center, it's also an abelian group. So congratulations, we have a subnormal series where these two quotients are both abelian. Oh, well, now we have the problem that this quotient might not be abelian. And now you can see the idea. We keep extending. Um, now you look at G mod G2. And while well, it has an obvious choice of an abelian normal subgroup, namely its center, and we keep extending. So then, using notation, the idea is we set, instead of using g sub i, we're going to use z sub i. We set z sub 0 g to be equal to 1, 
z sub 1 of g is just the center of g. And then assuming you've already defined z sub i of g, it follows from one of the isomorphism theorems that there exists a z sub i plus 1 of g that contains z sub i of g as a normal subgroup. And what do I have to have? Let me move this down. Such that when you take the quotient, you get something that's isomorphic to this center. So the whole idea is that I'm just trying to extend this sequence over and over. And so if I do this, I'm going to end up with this infinite, I'm going to end up with this chain. Of normal subgroups. With the feature. That each quotient is isomorphic to a center, which is an abelian group. So congratulations, we just proved that we can construct an, such a chain. Oh, but there are groups that aren't solvable, so there must be some sort of error in reasoning. The gap here is that <clears throat> there's nothing that tells us this terminates in G. So certainly, since we're dealing with the finite group, there's no way this goes on forever. So eventually, you're going to get a point where z sub i of g, well, we'll use z sub n of g, is equal to z sub n plus 1 of g. Once you get past some sort of point. <clears throat> There's going to be some sort of last point. And that's going to be exactly the point where the corresponding quotient group has a trivial center. And so now it turns out this strategy isn't guaranteed to give you a subnormal series for G, unfortunately. However, this does lead to a definition. We define a group to be nilpotent. If this series actually terminates in G. By the way, this series has a name. It's called the upper central series. It's called upper because as we'll discuss in a much later video, there's also another thing called the lower central series. So the upper central series is well defined for any group. And as I just pointed out, for a finite group, it's eventually going to terminate and, and be a finite length subnormal series. And you're nilpotent if that subnormal series actually, the last group is G itself. By the way, we just managed to see in this case, G is nilpotent. <clears throat> implies G is solvable. Why? Because the, in that particular case, this question mark is removed, you actually do in fact get a subnormal series for G itself where the quotients are abelian groups. And so you get the condition we wanted. And nilpotent groups are very useful because there's actually a nice 
way to construct the corresponding solvable chain by doing this specific procedure. In general, there isn't a nice procedure that works. Well, as we'll see in a later video, that's not entirely true, but this procedure is a useful one. I should point out, of course, why is it the case that this sequence has to terminate? Well, because if it doesn't terminate, then what you have is an infinitely increasing sequence of larger and larger groups. Each one has more elements than the last. Well, then, I mean, it's worth pointing out the union of all these ZIs. has to be a, a subset. And so if each of these is a proper subgroup, so that each of these sets is getting bigger than bigger, then you run into the problem that this union has size infinity. That's not possible if you have a finite group. So if you have a finite group, it must be the case that this series has to terminate. For those interested in infinite groups, the textbook does mention that um, there is a notion of something called being hypernilpotent, which is when this union becomes all of G. Finally, the smallest n for which this is, statement is true for a nilpotent group, the smallest n for which Z of n is equal to G is called the nilpotency class. And for the rest of the lectures, it's usually denoted with the number C. So here I'm going to try to build up our intuition a little bit about these groups before I move on. I mean, not the nilpotent groups, but rather this um, Z2 group. Because, well, it's your first time seeing it. Admittedly, it's essentially my second time actually thinking about it carefully. And so it's worth thinking about how to view these groups. It has the feature that when you mod out by the center, you get the center of the quotient. It's worth thinking about what this means, because it helps us build our intuition. So the idea is that you have, I'm going to take an element, and I'm going to bar, this is going from z to g to this quotient map. So barring is the quotient operation. What does it mean that it's in the center? It means that if I take x in this z2 group and any y in g, x bar y bar commutes in the quotient because I'm in the center. And that's for any y. And so I want to lift that upstairs, but it's a little difficult to do that. So I'm going to introduce something we haven't seen in this course yet, but we're going to need to see it in a little bit anyways. It's called the commutator. All I'm doing is multiplying both sides of this equation on the right by x inverse, bar inverse, y inverse. On the left-hand side of the equation, that gives me this expression. On the right-hand side of the equation, that gives me the identity. This is called the commutator. Um, oftentimes, you'll see the commutator denoted this way. In general, a commutator, by definition, or well, let's get rid of the bar. It's, it's A, B, A inverse, B inverse. And the important thing about commutators is that they're the identity if and only if A and B commute. So that's supposed to be why they were defined in the first place. They're just a way to tell you if something's commutes or not by just doing this calculation. And this shorthand notation is just a shorthand notation for, because it's easier to write A comma B square brackets than A, B, A inverse, B inverse all the time. 
and so we'll need commutators in a later lecture anyway, so it's finally time to introduce them, because it helps with understanding this group. It's from the perspective of commutators, we could have redefined the center as being all elements in the group G, with the property that for all other elements in the group, the commutator of x and y was the identity. In other words, x commutes with y. So that digression aside, here I'm saying x bar y bar commutator is the identity in this quotient group. Going upstairs, that means that x, y must give me an element in the center. So you can also define Z2G to be all those elements in Z, I mean in G, with the property that for all other elements in G, the commutator of X and Y lies in C1 of G. The thought here is that X and Y almost commute. They commute up to multiplication by some element in the center. So they don't commute on the nose. 